pray. Uh, Father God, we're just so grateful, so grateful that you are so, so good to us, that you deposit worth and value in us, and we receive that tonight. Your word is so valuable, Father, so valuable. There's, there's people that have died protecting it. People have given their life talking about it. People have given their life preserving it. So, Father, tonight, we do not take it for granted, the value that is in it tonight. And so we open our hearts to receive that what you have for us tonight, Father. Regardless of the messenger, I ask that you would speak to us tonight, that your word would become alive in our hearts. We open our hearts to receive it tonight. And, Father, I ask a blessing over every church that's around the Inland Empire and around the world. Father, even those persecuted churches, I pray that you will strengthen them as they try to move the gospel, even on the tremendous pressure. So, Father, we're grateful for each one of them because we do not compete against churches. We've always been on their side, advancing one kingdom, and that is yours, Father. So we declare that tonight together in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen, amen. Go to two places tonight. We're going to be in two places. No other... Um, not a lot of jumping around. It's a little atypical for me, um, this type of message, but it's been really just brewing in my heart for a while. And so I want you to go to Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55 and John 5. Isaiah 55 and the Gospel of John chapter 5. Isaiah 55 and the Gospel of John chapter 5. And so we're going to be hanging around those two areas tonight as we just talk about that which the Lord put in my heart. And so tonight, I just want the Word of God to speak on His own. The Word of God is tremendously powerful on His own and can do uh, so much change and so much good if you just let it operate in your life. So there's not much I have to say other than we'll read together and we'll explore together as we dive into this topic in plain sight, in plain sight. You know, I don't know how many of you, but I have sort of kids of all ages at this time in my life, but um, they're growing and it's so interesting. But every time... I ask my kids to go find something, they never find it. Have you witnessed that? Anybody with kids, right? You were probably one of those in your days. Yeah, amen. So um, the interesting, I started doing something different. I said, okay, if you can't find it, if I find it, I either charge them money, I'll uh, make them do a chore, they got to pay for something if they can't find it. And so all of a sudden, when I started doing that, things do appear all of the sudden. And so no matter how in plain sight things are, it's almost like, oh, it's not there. And you lift the towel and all of a sudden it's there. And so when we begin to surge, there's a lot of things that could be right in front of us. But many times we just either ignore it or don't know or can't see to focus enough in order to locate it. And that is like the worst thing. So something to be in plain sight and not see it. There's a few things I read online that I thought were kind of comical. It says, Marion's law is this. You can always find what you're not looking for. Yes or no? You always find what you're, oh, look, here it is. It's been a month. It's not going to find this, but I can't find what I'm looking for now. How about this one? The law of search. The first place to look for anything is the last place you ever expect to find it. Absolutely. is the last place. I remember we have lost some of our keys from our car, and um, we had an old van. And so nothing, we could not find it. One day we decided, hey, we're going to detail the van ourselves. And we decided to clean it. And it was behind the pocket that's behind the driver's seat, full of kids' food. Somehow the kids had grabbed it, shoved it in there, and it had been months with the keys in there. But it didn't happen until we went out and looked for it. And you know, there's a lot of things in life that are sort of like that. They're kind of right in front of you, but you quite can't get there. You quite can't grasp it. Here's how it's interesting. That God had to deal with Israel in this same matter. That God was a God that was always present. That God was a God that promised his presence, promised that he would be with them, promised that he would walk with them. But for whatever reason, no matter how present or how in their face God was, Israel always found a way to lose sight of God. And in Isaiah 55, we find an amazing invitation of God telling them how he wants to connect with them, how he wants to bring them back into the fold, bring them back into closeness with God. And let me tell you something. We live in a world today that is absolutely pushing us to lose sight of God in every matter, in every topic, more than anything, news, information is geared towards removing the reality of an existing God who's right in plain sight who's right in plain sight. And God is so present and so real, but we've chosen to remove God from that reality. And my invitation, and God's invitation tonight, is that you, who have decided already to be a follower of Christ, don't do that in your own walk with Christ. Because he is absolutely in plain sight. 
He's absolutely right there in front of us. And he has to deal with Israel in this matter. And there are three things I found in my heart that God moved me as God makes this offer to bring us close to him. And I want to explore those three things. The first is this, is that God's offer is always generous. God's offer is always generous. God is a generous God. He will always, um, he will always see, you will always see God wanting more for us than from us. Always, always. You read the word of God, God is always wanting more for us than he wants from us. He is an absolute generous God. And we have to believe that. But because in a first world like the United States is, we always tend to quantify God or God's generosity, generosity in the matter of money. And that is not necessarily true. I was just sharing with Pastor Dan and Pastor Joe. They were sharing with me their experience in the Philippines and how some of these pastors were, um, Pastor Dan was just sharing with me, yeah, this pastor was so excited because he was finally able to put a floor or he built his church around the swamp. And so when it rains, it stinks like sewage, but he's happy he has a floor and some walls. I mean, are you kidding me? But to him, the generosity of God for him is that God gave him the privilege to be able to serve. That's amazing. That's amazing. So when we flipped our minds as to God's generosity, is that God offers us in a generous manner when we don't deserve any of it. And that is really the essence of the gospel, is that because we walked away from God in sin, we really don't deserve any of it. But God says, hey, if we get closer, there's so much more I have for you because I've made a point to come close to you. Here's this invitation of a generous God. Isaiah 55, I'm going to read the international version of Isaiah 55 because it's a little more explanatory than the traditional version. Um, And so if you have the King James, the NIV will be here for you. Isaiah 55, 1 says, come all you who are thirsty and come to the waters. Jesus is saying, there's people who are thirsty, and this is not talking in a natural manner. He's talking in a spiritual manner. And he's saying, everyone who's thirsty, come to the water. He did not make a, a, a distinction in color, nationality. He said, if your qualification is thirst, you can come. If you really desire to connect with God, you can come. And you who have no money, come by and eat. Wait, 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 wait. This is getting ridiculous. So, so God is saying, if you're thirsty, you can come. If you have no money, if you've ever considered yourself broke, hey, there's a store where you can buy. And spiritually, brokenness is a reality of a world. And he's saying, you can come and buy too. Because he's a generous God. Look, look, he doesn't stop there. He goes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. We can make a parenthesis in the wine and explain a little longer, but God is not asking you to get drunk. Let's just go there. Um, But wine was a form of prosperity in the times of the gospel, and it was not, people didn't drink it all the time as we do in our society today. Until you tip over, you don't stop. That's not what it was about. Um, And so he's saying you can buy wine and milk without money and without cost. So here's a generous God saying, if you are in need, I am your source. If you are in need, I am your source. Whatever it may be, I'm available. And because we have so much available to us, I think the hunger from God has escaped a little bit from people. It hasn't escaped people, but we found ways to satisfy that, and we're going to find out why God had to come to Israel and do that. And in our own society, we tend to do that. We have a generous God putting so much in front of us, but we're willing to put everything aside because we feel satisfied. I don't know about you in the summer. I, again, I have small children. In the summer, my kids will even skip a meal if they can play video games. We don't let them, thank God, but they would. If we let them, they would because they found such a satisfaction in something that is not fulfilling. Well, a lot of adults do the same. We have found satisfaction in something that is not fulfilling. And a generous God is saying, I have plenty for you at no cost. No cost. Verse number two, why spend money on what is not bread? She's saying, why would you spend money? 
You can't buy that on something that won't satisfy you and your labor on what does not satisfy. And man, that is such a description of today's society and our lives and everything we see. We see people with absolutely everything and a tremendous hunger. And tonight, God is inviting us and saying, I'm a generous God and I am in plain sight. I am absolutely there. I'm not asking you for anything other than I have stuff for you. And this is so important. I began my own personal search at the beginning of this year where I told the Lord, I said, God, I, I don't want to be satisfied. I don't want to be easily satisfied. Even within ministry, even within the things I do, I, wanna, I want more of the real presence of God. I want a deeper connection with God because that is really the only lasting thing that we can find in our own lives. And this is so important, guys. This is so crucial. I'm not asking you to cancel Netflix, uh, uh, you know, subscription, but maybe God is asking you to work alongside that. I'm not asking you to stop meeting with friends or spending time or doing this or social media, but I'm asking what is really supplying the hunger that you have when God is saying, I have so much more available. And he's inviting us to do that. He's inviting us to do that. Look, I understand tonight is going to be a, a word that, uh, believe me, I struggle so much. I have like four days trying to write this message and trying to crank it out because it's a message that I believe the Lord wants us to work something in our spirit. And you're the mature crowd and you're here tonight and God is challenging us, beginning with myself. I'm not putting myself in a soapbox saying, you have to do this. I'm saying, God is inviting us as he invited Israel. And he said, listen. There's good stuff for you, but you're going to have to do something else. Are you with me tonight? God is a generous God. His offer is so generous. Number two is this, that God's offer has conditions. And here's where things get kind of complicated because the only unconditional thing that the word of God shows us is God's love. God's love is unconditional, so unconditional that he sent his son to die for us before he even knew you would want him. Or before, well, he knows everything, but before you would even make the decision. Let's say it that way. Explain it better theologically. Let's explain it that way. Before you even made your decision, God already sent the son. He loved you that much. And that's when we sang that song, how it raises our worth as, as a person. But everything else in the word of God has certain conditions. And people nowadays do not want conditions. And many people, if you read the gospel, walked away from Jesus the moment Jesus brought conditions. Ah, you can read this, but in the word of God says that Jesus fed, did the great miracle of feeding, told his disciples, jump in the boat. He meets them on the other side, and it's morning time. People can't find Jesus, and the word of God says they ran across the edge of the Sea of Galilee to meet him on the other side. Now, any minister would say, man, look at that. I'm bringing all these people to hear me preach, and Jesus says, y'all came today because I gave you bread yesterday. And the crowd got quiet because it was true. They weren't there because, man, he preached a good word and people got healed. They just saw it was free food and it was good food. Let's go wherever that guy is. But Jesus is saying there's, there's something deeper to work out in our own selves. There's certain conditions. And so he tells Israel, what are the conditions? I, everything is free, but you got to do something. Are you with me today? Isaiah 55, verse 2 to half of verse 3 says, Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what is, um, does not satisfy? Listen, listen. Every time the word of God writes something twice, he's saying, pay attention. So he's saying, listen, listen to me and eat what is good now how many of you heard that from your mamas right right eat what is good eat what is good eat vegetable eat your right portions so on and so forth it's such a struggle those who are raising kids where you were always trying to hey you got to eat what is good and you got to do this and you got to do that even for our own self let's be honest it is hard sometimes to just stick to a, a healthy diet all the time are you with me are you criticizing me? I'm just checking. It says, listen, listen, eat what is good. So he's describing what is the good thing to eat. And it says, and you will delight in the riches of the fair, meaning the banquet. Verse 3, give ear. So listen, listen, now give ear and do what? Do what? Come, come, is the verse there? And do what? Next verse, give ear and come to me that you may live that you may live there's a lot of people say pastor i would follow god if he shows himself to me 
And, and God has done that. And God is doing amazing things in other countries where it's not easily to preach the gospel. But you and I have access to the gospel freely with no criticism whatsoever. So the expectation on us as first world consumers of the gospel is we got to make an effort to get some of the stuff. It's uncomfortable tonight. Pastor Dan comes next weekend. He's our lead pastor. He'll do a better job. But there's an expectation. I'm getting to know this guy who's a missionary who works in the Middle East. He told me the story, and I couldn't believe it. On the phone, I started just crying, sitting in a nice office, thinking, what am I doing here? And here's the story he told me. He said, Pastor, I've been working in the Middle East, and God is revealing himself to Muslim in an amazing way. There's people coming to us saying, I had a dream and a vision about Jesus, and, and, I, and please tell me what I'm seeing, and just different visions. Just God is revealing himself to them because there's no openly way to preach the gospel. So he is revealing himself to these people, and the revival is amazing. You will never hear on the news. You're not going to find it on your Google search because there's people giving their lives to, to do this. He tells me, I had to meet up this one pastor who's been a pastor for over a year, and he read about the filling of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, but he didn't know how to do or what to do. So the translator contacted me so that we have a meeting in a cafe in, I don't remember what part, I think it was Afghanistan, what part, so we meet. But the problem is when I was on my way, left the hotel to go meet this particular pastor who had traveled hours to meet with me, I noticed that I was being followed. And so I realized... I'm in trouble. And so he said they walked, and as he walked down the street, he turned the corner, and this guy was right there. They greeted each other, and when he shook his hand, the Holy Spirit came upon the pastor, and he started speaking in tongues, and he said, I just said hi and walked away and just left them there speaking in tongues. And he said there's such a hunger for the reality of God. And I think the word for us is we have to find a way to bring that appetite back to us. Because we've been giving so much. And, and, and God is saying, there's a condition that you come. If I can have that verse again, verse 3. Give ear and come to me and come to me and listen that you may live. That is so powerful. It almost sounds like a threat from a parent. Have you ever done that to your kid? If you don't get out of here, kid, I'm going to send you where you came from. You don't do that with your kids? <laughs> he said, come near if you can get close, you will find life. And God is inviting us and saying, hey, I have everything for free. All I'm asking you to do is to take a step closer to me. That's all I'm asking you to take a step closer to me. And it's such a valuable lesson that he's working in our own life. Because we listen to obey. We listen to obey. But then he brings the second part. Verse 6. Verse 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. That to me is a scary phrase. That to me is a scary phrase in the Bible because it says, look for him while he could be found. So there's a possibility that there'll be a day you cannot find God. There's a possibility that one day you would be absolutely desperate and he cannot be found because his day has passed. And so God is saying, I'm inviting you now when there's a possibility, when there's a way, when you can connect in a way, and you have to make an effort to come close. Seek, seek me while I can be found. Call on him while he is near. Verse 7, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. So God is saying, here's what I'm trying to tell you. When you get close, there's certain conditions you're going to have to do. you got to listen. you got to keep finding. You have to walk away from the stuff you're doing. You cannot, you cannot remain in your sinful condition constantly and assume you will always be close to God. Now, God works with you. This is a process of maturity on all of us. There's stuff that you're going to have to work out. That's, that's normal. But you cannot just say, hey, I can do this and be okay on this way. He's saying, no, no, no. If you remove these things from your life, you will go up in our connection. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them and to our God for he will freely pardon. I love that. I love that. God loves you so much. That is offered, all he's saying is if you get close, you'll find forgiveness, you'll find everything I have to offer, you will find a good meal in your life. And it's such an important thing for us today because we live in a society that is absolutely withdrawing everything from us. 
and from my children and from every one of us. From entertainment to social media to political topics to the teachings in our school, everything is removing and God is saying, I am here and it's completely free. All I'm asking you to do is if you develop a hunger, come after me. Come after me and you're going to find a banquet to enjoy for. A tremendous banquet that would fill your life and will direct your life in a greater way. That's all God is asking of us. Point three, last one for tonight. Point three is this, that God's results are always better. God's results are always better. Even in earthly loss, God's plan in my life and in your life will always be better. At times we can feel, you know, uh, we can feel pretty overwhelmed in the things that are going on in our life. But in the end, God has a better plan laid out for us. He has a process he wants to work out in our life. And this is so important for people tonight to understand that even in loss, even in frustration, even in the condition you are, even in the pastor, you don't know what I've done and you don't know the condition. God is saying, look, if you trust me, if you come to the waters like I'm asking you, and if you come to get food from me and you listen and find me and search me, it's going to work out for your life. And God has done that in so many instances. There are more positive things to say when, God, when people have gone after God than not. When we work this out, something amazing happened. I was sharing with a little bit with the, our Spanish service and with some of our leaders. Just the other day, I was um, reminded of a story about Billy Graham. Billy Graham is probably the most influential evangelical or Christian uh, teacher, preacher, evangelist of the 20th century. And this, um, this amazing man of God passed away. And so they were doing a lot of his videos and a lot of things. And they share a story about him that so shocked me. And the story was this, if I have it correctly, is that he and another friend uh, would come often to Forest Falls to pray. And back in the 30s and 40s, they would come out out there into the mountains right here in California into Forest Falls and pray. And one of those times, he said that Bill Graham was wrestling with the theological aspect of salvation and the existence of God. Can you imagine? I was like, what? He did? If he did, then I'm good. Like, I can work this out. Like, whatever is all. Like, this guy is amazing. Like, this guy brought millions of people to the Lord. But he and a friend went up both with the same questions before the Lord. Now listen, this is so amazing. He said that Billy Graham came down the mountain and he resolved in his heart that God was true and that salvation was necessary for people to have a connection with God. This other friend of his never did and eventually walked away from the Lord, lost his family, lost his life. I, I was like, that cannot be real. Here's what the Lord is saying. Work it out with me. I have a plan for you that in the end is going to be much better than whatever we can figure out in our own minds and thoughts and ideas and plans and all this stuff. And we stay up at nine and we add it up and we withdraw and we would do this. And in the end, he works it out for good. He works it out for good. That's what he was telling Israel. Because once he invites Israel, then he tells them one of the most powerful words that you know, because Isaiah 55 is, we can preach hours on end on this stuff. But Isaiah 55 has a phrase you've heard all your life. So God says, I'm inviting you for free to eat of the goodness I have. But all I'm asking you is that you listen and you, and you go after me and you're going to find something good. Why? Why? This is why he tells them. Verse number eight, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. Verse 9, and as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So the Lord said, if you find me, I have a plan that you cannot come up with no matter how smart you think you are. You cannot come up with it because he's going to work it out. And that truth, when we come to him and say, God, I want to consume what you have because I'm broken, I'm in this state of my life, then God says, I have a plan. And it's going to be way better and way different than what you think you can come up with. And this is so crucial for us to trust the Lord in the process of what we do. Trust the Lord in this process. In no better way I can explain this than in John 5. And in John 5, Jesus puts this to a perfect demonstration. And I want to end with the story of John 5 because it's so crucial for us. The story of John 5 is the following. There is a pool called the Pool of Bethesda. And it was a pool of water, and the Bible describes it at this place in Jerusalem, and a lot of people visited. I've never had the privilege to visit Israel, 
Maybe someday I will, but, um, you know, the description says that this pool was there in the center of the plaza on the outside wall, and it has five columns sustaining this area. <clears throat> and from time to time, the Word of God says that an angel, uh, some translations doesn't describe the angel, but says something miraculous would happen in the water, and whoever got in the water first with their ailment would be healed. So imagine a pool, imagine a fountain outside, and hundreds if not thousands of people just around this thing, and whoever got there first and early, as soon as the water moved, you jump in. You find a way to get in, and your ailment would be healed in the moment. The power of God was in that water, and they would be healed instantly. So Jesus sees the scene. Here's the healer. Here's the restorer. Here's the one who actually has the power that's in the water. Are you with me? And so he walks and sees the scene and makes eye contact with one man. And this is his story. Now a certain man, verse 5, John 5, man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. It doesn't say he was 38 years old, but it says he's had it for 38 years. So we don't know his age, but he's been sick for a long time. When Jesus saw him, can you say that with me? Saw him. He sees you. I think a lot of people, including myself, when we go through stuff, we assume, man, God took a nap on my situation. But he sees you because he saw him. He said he saw him lying there and knew. Can you say he knows? He knows. So not only does he see you, he knows you. Not only does he see you, he knows you. And this is so crucial for us to get that in our own life. And let me, let me just, I feel make a parenthesis. This goes to people who've been a Christian a long time. Because people who've been a Christian a long time, including myself, we get in the habit of knowing theology, but we don't really feel a connection with it. And God is inviting us to move past the knowledge of what we see and actually engage him in what we know. Because he knows me and he sees me. Are you with me tonight? And he says he knew that he, that he already had been in that condition for a long time. So Jesus has a word of knowledge that knows, hey, this guy's been sick a long time. And he says to him, do you want to be made well? I love God's question. Because never has God asked a question to find out the answer. He already knows the answer. It said in the previous verse, he said he already knew the guy had been sick a long time. But Jesus wants to find out if you want it. Jesus wants to find out if you want it. Because that is the question for our society today. A lot of people want stuff, but they don't really want stuff. And God wants to know if you want this. That is the challenge for all of us. Um, I don't want to embarrass my daughter, but uh, recently she, she likes trying everything. So last year she's like, uh, no, the beginning of this year, she's like, I want to try softball. I want to try softball. I'm like, oh my gosh, come on. And I love baseball. I mean, I'm Dominican, so that's all we do. My uncle is, you know, the, the director of a league, professional league of softball. So I, I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. So finally I'm like, okay, let's get into it. I explained to her, Abby, you got to know. This is important. You, you know, we, we Ugandas, we stick to our decisions. We got to do this right. And so, you know, given this, she's only eight years old. But I'm just laying in time. <laughs> so we go by this bat, you know, Ken Griffey, whatever, you know, sign. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They go that far. Um, but, you know, we get her all this uniform, all this stuff, and she starts playing. And she's, she's a good athlete, as you. She's a good athlete. She's just not motivated at times. So she picks up the game, and, you know, she's getting with it. But then she starts losing this passion. She's like, no, Abby, you know, you made a commitment, and we're this and that. And so you're going to go, man, by the end of the season, we wanted to take her out. We're like, we're done with this stuff. This is craziness. I'm free out of here, you know. Um, but I told her, I said, do you want to play again? And she absolutely said, I'll play soccer any day, Dad. And she hates soccer. Um, and so what I was trying to work with her is sometimes we want something, but we got to know if we really want something. And the reason why God is asking this question is because Jesus wants to know, hey, man, I know you've been here a lot. I know you've been sick a long time, but do you actually like it? Because you know what I found in my Christian walk? is that some people have gotten so comfortable with what they have, they're actually okay with it. They're actually okay with it. And God is inviting us saying today, man, if you get uncomfortable enough, 
you may want to do something about that. So he says, hey, do you want to be well? Verse number seven, the sick man answered to him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. So he's explaining, saying there's an issue. Like, sure, he didn't say sure, but he focused on what he doesn't have, which is what a lot of us do. A lot of us do that, and let, let's be honest, we do that. Instead of saying, yes, can you help me, man, roll me over. As soon as you see that, what, roll, he didn't say none of that. He said, well, the reality is I'm here probably every year, every time this stuff happens, but the reality is that nobody throws me in the water. The question is, how in the world did he get there? <laughs> At least the other guys who went through the roof, he had four friends lowering him into Jesus. So this guy somehow makes it there every year, but somehow he's not strong enough to put himself in the water. And he's so focused in what he doesn't have. And Jesus is trying to get to him in what he does have. And that's his invitation. He's saying, I'm a generous God. I have plenty for you. But you're going to have to do something. Here's the condition of God. So Jesus says to him, Jesus says to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Jesus says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. I want to show you something that doesn't happen in the story. Jesus didn't help him up and didn't roll up his mattress. Pastor, that theology is kind of problematic. <laughs> Jesus said to him, because the power of the word of God is so profound. The power of the word of God acting in your life is so profound. And Jesus said to him, he said, if you can get this, if you can get it in your head and in your soul, if faith can be activated, if the word of God can come alive, you can do this. You can do this. He said, you rise up, you take up your bed, and you walk. And on that verse, we can teach a ton. I mean, there's a whole other message there. But Jesus is saying, Jesus didn't just see his brokenness and left him there but he also gave him away and said hey man you actually you have to do something in order to walk away from this condition but i got something for you and it was so powerful verse number nine is awesome and immediately can you say that word immediately one two three immediately <laughs> this guy must have felt a bolt of lightning hit his life through the word of god and he said Let's do this. Immediately, the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And the story gets super good. I don't have time to explain it. It gets really funny. The Pharisees go crazy because Jesus healed them on a Saturday. And so, it, you know, the religious people are always going to have something to say about the good that is happening in your life. Don't pay any attention to that. Don't pay any attention to that because God is doing good. And it's out, he's about to do good in your life. So here's what the Lord wants for us tonight. As this word comes at us, when I said, God, what is it that you want for us at the rock tonight? Here's what the Lord says. Just come after me. Just come after me. Just come after me. He will not reject you. He will not shut the door on you. Come after me because I have so much good for you. That's what he told the children of Israel. Israel was absolutely lost doing this, doing that, finding this, finding that, going here, going there. We want these gods. We want this. And God is saying, I I've been such a good God to you. Why are you so enamored with everything else around you when I've been so good with you? There's such goodness in the Lord. And the goodness of God wants to reach your life. And all he's saying is, come after me. I don't know what's going to take for you to come after God. But he's saying, if you listen, if you find, if you seek me, you will find me. And go after me while I can be found. While I can be found. Because in the end, it's going to be so much better for you. Close your eyes. Let's pray together. Father God, I am asking tonight that the offer you've put before in Isaiah 55 is that if we come after you, it is a generous offer. And if we come after you, you say that you have better thoughts and better ideas that we can ever come up with. I am asking tonight that every person in this room receives a word this moment of what you want for them to do in order to receive the banquet that you've laid out before them. Father, I'm asking you that we no longer be satisfied with the things that absolutely entertain us or fill our mind not that you're against entertainment we're asking that we be filled with you lord that only you will bring enjoyment enjoyment pleasure direction joy in every area i curse the spirit of alcoholism tonight lord god may not no more satisfaction in that starting tonight i place joy 
in them tonight, Father God. I just curse that. I don't know, I'm praying for that. God is asking to pray for that. I come against alcoholism tonight, that you would break it upon the minds and hearts of people tonight, Father. That they find you satisfaction in you tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, we all say amen. God spoke to you. Give him a hand tonight. So I believe God had for me tonight. It's a little different, kind of out of the wheelhouse for me as I normally teach, but I just believe he wants us to come after him in a greater way.